Episode 64 of People I Know Show. Kurt Carson's with Dave Overland in St. Cloud, number. Minnesota. Yeah, 64. 64. It's about a year and four months, five months. I'm starting to lose track a little bit. Congratulations. Thank you. That's a big number. But we can't stop at 64 or 60, 63 <laughs> and a half. So we're going we're gonna to forge ahead today. Dave, I was thinking to the last time that I would have seen you, you're going to have to help me here. You didn't follow my path exactly, but you were the broadcaster for the Alexandria Beatles. That's for, right. Was it one summer? Yeah, just one. And what year was that? 2011. I was with them from 2002 through 2006, and this has been a connection to a few of my guests before. So 2011, and I was working with the Northwoods League at that time. Oh, that's right. In the front office. So I probably haven't seen you since... 2011. You did five seasons? Five seasons, yes. Holy that, cow! It was fun. Great time. Met and got to know a lot of great people. That was too long, I think, for <laughs> any gig at that level, but I didn't really realize at the time. And one thing, I, as I look back at my life, and I think I'm going to draw some connections with you perhaps here, is I don't know that I had the right sort of mentors in the broadcasting field, and so it took me a while to figure some things out. And now you have been in St. Cloud working in broadcast media since how long after 2011 did you settle back into here? Uh, 2013. So se this is seven years now that I've been here. So I think, I think the big difference is when I took the Beatles job, I was 29. Okay. So I was an old man by Northwoods League terms. 29. So you are, what, 38 right now? Yeah, just turned 38 okay. uh, two weeks ago. Happy birthday. Thank you. I'm, I guess I missed that one. <laughs> I'm not a big wish happy happy birthday to people on Facebook no? anymore. I, I like to, but then I just it gets exhausted. I go in I, phases. I, yeah. Me Sometimes too. I ride the train for a couple weeks and then I just blow it. Around off. my birthday, I think I'm more active. Yeah. So I feel like I, I think that's be. fair. Trying to gain favor with people, get them to wish you a happy birthday. Yes, I think so, and it helps a little bit. <laughs> I feel guilty when other people wish me happy birthday that I know I didn't wish them. That's when I start feeling guilty. Here's what I've done for most of the last many years is I will personally comment at least a thank you and sometimes like ask a question, which can be overwhelming to keep up with that. But I'll do that on Facebook because I feel like, and maybe this is on a smaller scale example, like I haven't seen you in a long time. We've interacted with a little bit on Facebook. I've seen some of the stuff you've been doing on Facebook, which leads to me wanting to talk to you today. But I think that it's the annual opportunity for whatever percentage of people that are your friends on Facebook that take the moment to interact with you that you wouldn't talk to otherwise, it's the annual opportunity to keep some sort of a distant connection alive. So yeah. I like to do that. A reason to keep them on your Facebook page. Yes. Like, I do care about you enough once a year to say happy birthday. Well, Sometimes even just HBD. I, I cared enough to add you or you added me why do we still have this if we don't ever communicate? So if you're go if one person's going to reach out to me, I will, if possible, I'll make the effort to at least say something. Personalize and, it a little yeah, bit. I like to. That, I, that's, I think that makes sense to me. And, and the, the podcast has been a reason. Like, I, I thought years ago, like, I added this person. We already, like, after a year, never talk. Why, why do I have these people on my Facebook and my social media? And I think it's because this, this thing that came together... 10 years later, sure. me having a podcast, and then there's been a handful of people that, because of the connection maintained, that I've had on the show. And I guess you're one of them. I don't think I would ever, like, delete, thought to delete you the way some people that I had even, like, a much lesser connection. But that would be my advice to people is there's at some point in your life, if you're creative, if they're creative, if something's going on. Never know. And something might come up. Not with everybody, but with enough people that you'll be happy that you saved everybody. I feel like I have an easier time dropping real friends than Facebook friends. <laughs> like, I feel like if somebody wrongs me in life, I'm quick to be like, I'll oh, forget them. I don't need them in my life. But on Facebook, I'm like, oh, I'd hate to hurt their feelings and unfriend them. It's a really weird situation. Social media is an odd thing. I can't keep track of the people that have unfriended me. I, I think, though... I don't want to. Well, I don't keep track, but if you've ever noticed, you go through your... This happened seven years ago today, for instance. Yes. And you look at that, and you'll see a name they haven't seen in a while. And if you happen to click on it, you'll realize, oh, that person's not. They commented on this eight years ago. 
at some point they decided to unfriend yeah, what me. What did I do? And I think usually it's some girl that I might have been like dating or something or had sure. some connection to that's now married and for whatever the reason she thinks it's best to like totally disconnect from all their past potential dating partners. I boyfriends. think that's fair. Yeah, I don't. It but doesn't when it's like me. a random guy from high school. It's really odd. Like, what? Why? What did I offend you? I didn't. I put a picture up of my kid, and you dropped me. It's a little weird. I was thinking about this very recently, and this is totally off track from what I thought we'd talk about. And we'll get to the things <laughs> we will talk about. There's one person in particular. I'm good at that. Great. <laughs> one person in particular from my past that I know unfriended me because we had some some issue. And this is going back several years ago. We were like pretty good friends before that. And I was thinking, at some point. Maybe I reach back out and see if he wants to talk about it on the podcast. Because these are the things that happen in life that I don't think we get closure from. And not that we need closure always, but to better understand why people do what they do. Yeah, it's related to have conversation. Yep. So, yeah. So now I'm, I'm slightly more likely to reach back out to him if, if I'm able to get to him. I probably still have his number. So. It's a spinoff. People I used to know show. <laughs> well, that's a part of it. I mean, it's pe- people I know show is the name. But sometimes it's people I've met, and I think in one or two cases, it's like people I've wanted to meet. I, it's, I'm stretching it, but it, once I have them on the podcast, and you know, they now you know someone them. I know. So, people I now know show with you, Dave. Here's something that happened that ties back into my time at St. Cloud State slightly, because I I went to St. Cloud State University here in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and I went there to continue my broadcasting career. I'd done some. Because my brother had done it, Chuck, he was in broadcasting. He had begun to fade away from it. I kind of took over for him doing some stuff at the local radio station back in my home area. And then I decided I better continue my education with the St. Cloud. The first time I ever had any interaction with people in St. Cloud at St. Cloud State for broadcasting was at Old Selkie Field, which is the old football field for the St. Cloud State Huskies. And that would have been probably like, the fall of 2003. It's a long time later, but it was, I think, based on your post or definitely something else shortly thereafter that I saw on Facebook that it will, I realized just a couple months ago, December, not even uh, two months ago as we speak, that St. Cloud State football ceased to exist. And you wrote uh, a blog post for the, the radio station in town here that was opinionated, maybe a little aggressive, but it seemed fair because I think a lot of people shared the sentiment. So uh, take me back to to that time and some of the things that transpired and what's happened at this point. Yeah, I mean, basically, we had a situation in 2015 at St. Cloud State where a number of programs were canceled. I think it was four programs were canceled at that time. Track and Field was one of them. And They had a Title IX lawsuit pending, so there's already some resentment in the athletic department as far as how things are being run, some questions being. And then we came into work on a Tuesday morning, and I saw on Twitter a bunch of the St. Cloud State football players were talking about having secrets hidden from them. So I did some digging, I made some phone calls, and I finally got back from a source that they were going to cut the football team later that day. So I tried to do my due diligence. I reached out to the sources up top at St. Cloud State. Nobody was getting back to me. And finally, they sent out a press release and said, yeah, we're, we're cutting the football team at 2.30 this afternoon. And it was really frustrating because they had cut the football program before in 2010. But the students had a vote. They raised the activity fee, and they saved the football program. This time, nobody had an opportunity to raise money. Nobody had an opportunity to have their voice heard. It was just the president of the school came in, said the football team's done, and then the president and the AD left the building, and they left these football players and Coach Underwood, who's been here for 18 years, to sit there and answer questions from the media. You were a KVSC guy, I'm guessing. I was. I was a KVSC guy, and with all due respect to KVSC, We didn't know what we were doing when we were there. We didn't know tact, and we didn't know how to gently approach an interview. So I just I felt for Coach Underwood sitting there with these 18-year-old kids putting a microphone in his face. What does it feel like to lose your job? I really didn't. I didn't really appreciate that. And so I kind of went on the offensive a little bit and wrinkled some feathers. But I don't really have any regrets for what I did. It's how I felt, and it's my job to tell people how I feel. You say you rankled some feathers, and I remember one of these indications was 
So were you the play-by-play -play voice of Huskies football as of recently? So I was the color commentator. Color commentator. So yeah. you worked for, you worked game days. You were at all the games for Correct. a few years. Yeah. And based on that, that blog post or however you want to describe it, something transpired. I mean, there wasn't a football team anymore anyhow, but Right, still. but I also did other, like I would fill in for the hockey team and I'd fill in for a coach's show and that sort of thing. And they asked me to take what they call the hiatus from that position uh, because of the story that I posted. You know, I, I get it. I don't really blame them. I, I think if I was in their position, I'd probably do the same thing because technically I was a St. Cloud State employee and you don't do that, right? You don't burn your employer in that way. But at the same time, I had a connection with the coaches. I had a connection with the players and the campus and the city of St. Cloud. And I felt like somebody needed to speak up and say something because it's a situation where we've seen nine sporting teams cut in the last seven years at St. Cloud State, while other schools like Bemidji, Duluth, Mankato, with similar programs, similar enrollment sizes, aren't cutting any sports. And so I just I felt like we, we were owed a little bit more of an explanation. I totally agree. And I think what happens too often or almost all the time, is someone isn't willing to say the thing that might put them in hot water or get them fired, but that allows stuff to continue moving in a direction. I'm not saying what you said is going to stop anything, but the fact that you were willing to say what someone needed to say, it seemed like, I'm, I'm an outsider now. I went to St. Cloud State. I've had no affiliation. I've barely been on campus in the last decade. I don't even know. I feel like besides the occasional mailer for more money, no one from the university has been in contact with me. They don't seem to really care what I have done or haven't done. Not necessarily I've done anything necessarily worthwhile. I know what but, you mean. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the experience is supposed to be like or what other alumni association things are like, but I haven't. I feel left behind, too. I, I haven't felt like these people care about me now that I'm not paying tuition. And maybe that's totally normal. Yeah, maybe. I never went to any other school either. I'm a St. Cloud State guy, too. Um, but I just, I really, I felt like just putting out a written statement wasn't enough. And I don't know that St. Cloud State really understood the gravity of the decision that they made. I think they looked at it as dollars and cents, whereas I looked at it as St. Cloud residents and, you know, our kids in this community and the coaches who have been here forever. And this was not something that they warned the football team about last year and said, if we don't turn it around... By my understanding, this was something that just happened. I mean, it just it happened one day, and I didn't think that was right. I don't have any beef with St. Cloud State. I don't have any beef with anybody in the athletic department. But at the same time, someone had to say something. With this, and you had mentioned a few of the universities that have you know, their, their football program, and not that this, as a Division II university, the, the football program is like that important, but I think the way it was handled... And the fact that it doesn't exist anymore says something about the university. The fact that when I was going to school in St. Cloud State, the University of North Dakota and North Dakota State and South Dakota State and South Dakota, all those schools, which I think are all now Division I, yeah. they were Division II. They played in the same conference. St. Cloud State was playing those teams. I don't know if they like competed that well overall in most of the sports on the field or on the court. But at that time those schools were all the same. And at a certain point, I think the decision began to be made or needed to be made to stay relevant or, or something that some schools were gonna go to Division I. It's been many years, but for many years, for instance, North Dakota State University in Fargo, which population size, I don't know how different it is. It's not that different right. school size, not that different. They are the best in the second tier of Division I football, winning national championships basically every year. And most of those schools have had some athletic success at the Division I level. Right. Meanwhile, St. Cloud State and some others stayed Division II. But for the most part, like MSU Mankato is having great athletic program success in a lot of the sports, I believe. Minnesota Duluth at D1, they went in hockey. St. Cloud State has been pretty good in hockey, it seems like, in recent years. But the D2 programs, the fact that they've cut how many now in the last five years? Nine in the last seven years. That's and These things, obviously, they're not money makers, but it just sends the wrong signal to someone that wants to be a part of anything athletic coming here or, or really the university at all. If, if this is a university that is cutting and cutting and cutting, maybe unless you really have a, something that really brings you here, 
you're probably going to choose to go somewhere else, I'm guessing, and that well, seems to be what's happening, right? Try convincing a wrestler that you're safe. Try convincing a baseball player that you're safe. You're making the recruiting harder for every other, every other sport outside of maybe men's hockey because it's a Division One program and they're certainly not going anywhere. But I think this the trickle-down effect, like you mentioned, is bigger than they realize it is. And if you look at it objectively, Mankato has more students. But, like you said, they have a nationally prominent Division II football program. They have a fairly new arena in downtown where they play Division I hockey at a high level. Duluth has almost to a person the exact same enrollment as St. Cloud State. Brand new arena, downtown Duluth, right on the water, I guess not technically downtown. And they've got a nationally relevant Division II football program as well. And then Bemidji, that's the one that I just can't get past. <laughs> Bemidji has 4,000 students. St. Cloud State has 11,000. And Bemidji has a Division II football program. Not great, but not bad. And they have a brand new hockey arena, I suppose is a little bit older now, that they play hockey in Division One as well. So those are three schools very similar to St. Cloud State. Same types of funding. They all figure out a way to make it work. But yet St. Cloud State can't figure it out, and nothing changes besides they get rid of teams. I've been to Bemidji a few times, and... I can't say that for me, it's not a place I'd want to like go to school or make no. my life because it's not a bad town. It's very it's cold. Just, it's it's extreme, kind of extreme northern Minnesota, and it's so far from everything. And Duluth maybe not so different, but that's a that's a pretty town. Yes, like it's got the Lake Superior there, and people take vacations there. I don't think people take vacations in Bemidji. Not that they're taking vacations in Mankato or St. Cloud. <laughs> But it's just another example of some a school university that's been able to work their finances in a way. Yes. Even if their athletic programs aren't making that much money or enough money or however that is, to make sure that what you're doing, what you think is important, can be sustained. And St. Cloud State hasn't prioritized athletics or is just using athletics as a way to make up for the other things they've screwed up in the past. I, I, don't, I don't know enough about it, but it's, it's sad for me. It, you know, That's this. exactly it. And I heard a lot of times you write an opinion piece, and at best you'll get 60% positive comments and 40% people telling you you're an idiot. Why would you think that? For whatever reason, this opinion piece, 100% positive feedback. <laughs> Everyone was saying exactly Except what the, you were the saying. people from the university. That... Well, the people that, yeah, were really in charge. <laughs> and then who you named and, you know, called them out. Exactly, because sometimes you need to be called out. I'm yeah. sorry, and I'm not here to hold a grudge, but that happened. And all the alumni said, sad day to be an alum. I'm ashamed to be an alum. I can't believe this is happening. This is a huge mistake. Not one person said, why don't you see it from their side? Or I can see why this happened. It was 100% on my side, which was really eye-opening to me because that never happens. And you and I are both sports guys. I, I, was, I think I pulled up your Facebook profile or something and just tried to get a, a sense of how big of a sports fan you were or are. And I can, I can tell that we're kind of... Maybe kind of the same. I don't know how, how much you watch everything now, but growing up, that's oh, yeah. what the, my life was sports. And I think that's kind of how we both got into the sports broadcasting. And you're, you've remained working in sports and news media, and I've gotten away from it for years um, until I brought back the podcast. But it's not sports really. Normally, I don't talk about anything sports. Right. Related. Like one of every 20 episodes, I think, comes up with sports. But when I think about St. Cloud State and the athletics, it's... Like I, now, I don't. I don't follow any. I don't follow the hockey team. They were like the number one team in the nation last year, I think. And I, yeah. I don't care, but <laughs> I don't think it's a good thing when you're cutting programs. And that's. I just don't see the, the enrollment has been declining rapidly. I think when you went in in the early 2000s, it was around 18,000, and now the latest numbers have said it's around 11,000. I don't understand, just optically, how cutting sporting teams is going to bring more students to your campus. I don't think it does. I don't think it does at all. I don't see how it could. But maybe, and you, you made it sound like it might have been a very short-term decision, like this is a budget shortfall and they got to they gotta cut something and someone, the individuals you mentioned or others, or the, the board, whoever makes these decisions, I'm so far of it, I don't know, that in the short term they decided we're going to do this and just do it. Because we did it four years ago with these other little sports, yep. little sports, that we can do it with football and get away with it. And, you know, I guess, I don't know what's going to happen now. I, I don't get a sense of what's going on in this city. 
both the univers university and then after that, I want to talk more about the city itself. But sure. what is happening? What's going to happen with the university now? Is what's what's what are you hearing since in the, in the two months since? Well, on Friday, I believe it was. It was within the last week. They got a settlement, one point two million dollar settlement against them. St. Cloud State has to pay out one point two million for the first round of sporting cuts because they violated Title IX. So not only did they cut sports in 2015, they did it illegally against Title IX, so they got a judgment against them. Then they went and cut other sports. So the same body that filed the suit, the civil suit for Title IX, is now suing them again because they say that cutting the teams they cut this time is contempt of court because they're continuing to do things while this judgment was pending. Oh, so wow. they they're still in a little bit of hot water over all of this, and I, legally I have no idea. It has something to do with, you have to have, there's a misconception that you have to have the same number of women's sports and men's sports, but it's athletes. And so... Scholarship it, athletes, is it, or is it athletes? Uh, I think it's athletes, but you might be right. It might be scholarship The total athletes. value of the scholarships has to be equal. So having something. a football team, you have how many people? A lot. And it's hard to even that out with women's sports. And I think they thought that that would get them back in compliance. That was part of it as well. Outside the budget was that the Title IX compliance thing was a factor. But again, the other schools figure it out. Yeah, it's not a good situation over there. It's not a good situation at all. One, and it's sad. One last thing on that. What, what do you know from the, the, the players that would have otherwise been here for a few more years? Uh, maybe the timing was at least kind of good, but the fact that it might have given them a chance to transfer somewhere by this new semester that was starting in January. Has that happened? Yeah, there have been a handful of guys that have ended up at different schools, a lot of them in Mankato or at Moorhead, schools within the NSIC. But boy, I, I got to think there's at least 70% that it's just, it's over for them. That I, I think that, and I'm, that number is off the top of my head, it's not official. But I, I don't think it's more than about 30 or 40% of guys that found a new home. Were they able to or forced to like honor scholarships beyond this year or did that immediately get cut off? I think that their scholarships would be good through their senior year. Okay. I believe that was the case. But, and they also, which I think is the right thing to do. They also allowed them to not sit out a year. They waived the transfer okay, rules. For those so that they, wanted to pursue it. Right. They could go to a different school and play right away, which I'll give them credit for that. But what else are you going to do? Yeah. Hold them to it? Well, it's I'm, so frustrating. It's just, it's so frustrating. And I probably overreacted a little bit with my, with my post. But like you said, as a St. Cloud State guy, it, it was just very frustrating how it all went down. I never want to be a part of the thing that seems to be slowly or quickly falling apart. Exactly. That's... Yes. I want to be proud of the school that I went to. And I guess I don't understand why a year ago they didn't send out something and say, listen, this program is in jeopardy right now. We need corporate sponsors or we need the community to rally and let's figure this out. It was more like they just had it in the back of their mind. And then at the end of the year, they were like, OK, it just yeah, it didn't it didn't sit right with me. Yeah. What about St. Cloud? Like I, when I lived here, I didn't even live on campus. I lived with my cousin first when he was living in Sartell and then Sauk Rapids, which of course are like the neighboring suburbs. If, if there are suburbs of St. Cloud, those are two of the few. I don't hear a lot of good things from a distance <laughs> about the way people that live here perceive this city, but maybe as someone that's been living in larger cities and living in the Twin Cities, I think that just might be a uh, a convergence of a small town attitude with a kind of the city changing in ways that make it feel maybe like a big city with the, the, some diversity and international influence and refugees and different things. How how would you how do you perceive what's going on in St. Cloud? Is this as good or better or worse of a place to live than it might have been when I was around? I, I can't speak to that. I really had never even been here until I moved here in 2012. I didn't know anything about St. Cloud, so I can only go back to 2012. So you, were you a commuter too then? Yeah, I okay. drove every day for four or three and a half years from Minneapolis to St. Cloud oh, every day. Oh, I Wow, okay. Yeah, six days oh, a week. wow, that's a long time. <laughs> it was brutal. Yeah, it was brutal, but you got to do what Which you Which is about do. An, an hour drive or so, depending on exactly where you're coming from. And the traffic was, yeah. that was the backbreaker. Um, I, I do think that there... I want to put this delicately because I do like the people in St. Cloud, but I think that there are a lot of people 
that are hesitant when it comes to change. I think that would be the best way that I could put it, um, that there is an influx of refugees coming from Somalia. There are a lot of misconceptions about what the government provides to them when they come to our country and what programs they're offered as opposed to what people from here are offered. And there's a lot of butting of heads going on. For that reason, I think that there's a misconception that the Somali refugees are taken care of better than people from here are, which is simply not true in my opinion. I think everybody has the opportunity to get help when they need it. So that does cause a lot of tension in this area. And I think sometimes it gives St. Cloud a reputation of being an intolerant place, which may or may not be well-deserved. Um, but it's tough to be around as someone who, I grew up in Apple Valley, I lived in Minneapolis, I've lived in St. Paul, I spent time in, in California. I'm much more used to diversity than I think people in central Minnesota tend to be. Not everybody, but if you go on social media, you look at some of the comments, some of the things that are said, it, it gets a little bit frustrating because personally, I was, I'm just used to it. I just, I was, not that I'm more accepting, I'm just not as surprised when diversity happens. I get sucked into those comment sections. I wish I wouldn't. Like, I think it's WCCO TV. Maybe that's just one of a few of the media outlets in the Twin Cities that have followed. I don't know if these people are living in the Twin Cities or they're outstate people. There's a lot of really negative racist people, openly negative and racist, anytime anything relating to someone, usually from like Somalia. Usually Somalia. But yeah. other, other places in the world that it's just, it's like, wow, these people are raising their hands saying this is what I think and I'm apparently proud of it and good I guess I, I think it's good for people to to not be afraid of, of who they are it's just it's kind of again sad for me that I feel like I've met so many people from all over including I had one of my guests it was somewhere in like the early 30s episode a lady from Somalia came here 20 years ago and I happened to be one of her tutors when she was studying for a GED. And to get to know her and her story and know that, yes, hers is just one story out of many and not everything's the same. But to get a better understanding of someone from a different place that came here with nothing and is just trying to find an opportunity, knowing that that's going to be a similar idea for a lot of or most of or maybe all of the people that come here from that part of the world, I my heart is... It's way softer with all these people that are here and, and that how hard it might be to to adapt. I just I'm so I'm so far on the other side of that conversation when I do see people with the, the racist negative comments that I understand why that exists and how that can exist. But it seems like it kind of feeds off of each other in this city worse than most places and it even if those narratives aren't true, and I think a lot of them aren't, they just they build and build and build, and people are very certain that they have all the correct answers when it comes to why these people are here and what they are getting and not getting, and I don't know how to make it change if it ever is going to change. And I think those people aren't the majority in St. Cloud. I think the majority in St. Cloud are good people and open-minded people, but I think they're the more vocal minority when it comes to being on social media and making those comments. I think people in this town are much more apt to say the negative thing than the people are to come on and say, I welcome them to town. Um, when I was a teenager, I worked at Mall of America and I was at a place that fixed watches. And I think I had three or four coworkers that were from Somalia. And I didn't think anything of it. I mean, they were nice to me. You know, we flirted because we were teenagers and we'd go get lunch together and all this stuff. And I guess I never really thought of them as being that different than me. They just seemed they had an accent. You know what I mean? And, and I was patient with them when they were trying to figure out the words to say. And I think more people need to have that experience. They need to be locked in a room with someone from Somalia or locked in a room with someone from Liberia and be forced to have an actual conversation. Where are you from? What was your home like? What kinds of things are you interested in? What are you afraid of in, in the United States that maybe you're not comfortable with? Because there's like this, this weird perception that they're here to destroy our country or destroy St. Cloud when really they're just coming from a very different culture and they want, they don't want to fit in necessarily, but they want to coexist. Yeah. They're not here to disrupt your life. 
they're here for the same thing you are to raise their kids to have a happy life to be productive get an education it's the same story as your kids and your grandkids and this has been going on in this part of the country this part of the world for decades and i guess centuries people come from different places and then coexist it's just that and maybe this happens every time it happens uh, but i think at this point in history there's clearly like more clearly a different look in a different dress and then the different religion than a lot of the people which makes it potentially more divisive but one of my my side gig is a uber and lyft driver and as i was driving to st cloud today i, I happened to pick up a rider that was in like Otsego, somewhere in between because i told the app i was coming here i need to be here by two and it, I, I picked up this guy we had a little conversation and I could tell that he carried the sentiment. Every time someone gets in my car and they, they're, they're like, I can tell, oh, this person's about to say something racist. And it's like, okay, I'm, I, I kind of brace myself and try to have a good, healthy education, potentially educating, or I try to learn from this person what they know and what, what I think I know and just see if that can just push something one step closer in the right direction and i think something that i threw out there is like so these people end up here why is it like the local churches or why why do they end up here and then i don't know i think he went off on some other tangent but it was i could tell i was getting closer to saint cloud i thought maybe by the fact that this guy had these viewpoints and he was in my car yeah and you know we'd be kidding ourselves if we said it only happens in saint cloud or no. it only happens in central minnesota but there is there is an element of people in saint cloud that do you're right they seem to almost be proud of it like they've got their public facebook profile with the picture of them and their kids and they're saying these awful things on social media and i just i can't believe it but but then there's a lot of people that agree with them so when you have people in your circle that agree with you then then you think your position's right and and i and i like to kind of angle myself towards being right about everything but i'm not right about everything i don't know everything everyone's perspective is worth hearing because they have that perspective based on everything around them and what's led up to them in that point in their life. I just, I wonder sometimes how I went one way and someone else seems to be going another way with their thoughts on something that, you know, 20 years ago, I might've agreed with these people. I don't know. One thing that frustrates me is, is the lack of open-mindedness. It's not that they think this thing and they're willing to have their mind changed. It's, I think this thing and you're an idiot if you think something else. I think that's the biggest the biggest hurdle that we have to overcome in society in general is that we have to at least listen to the other side a little bit. I mean, you can even look at the impeachment thing. Neither side wants to hear each other. No. They're just butting heads oh. over and over again, and I won't get into all that. <laughs> but I think it's the same thing with race relations in the United States and in central Minnesota anywhere. It's that neither side really wants to listen to the other. It's a chicken and the egg situation where both sides think the other side's wrong. Yeah. It's tough. It would be extremely difficult for you or me to pack our bags right now without a dime, without a job, without a place to live, and go to Somalia. Can you even imagine? Don't you? Can you even you imagine? You would get robbed or killed because it's a terribly dangerous place. But and just culturally. Yes. <laughs> and I'm saying they're coming here, crossing their fingers, hoping for a better life because they live in fear every single day in Somalia. And they're like, I've heard America's great. There are opportunities there. We can get an education. We won't have to worry about this and that and the other thing. And then they get here and everyone's thumbing their nose at them and telling them, get out of my town. I mean, how awful. And what I think a lot of people don't realize, and I guess I can't be certain of this, but I'm pretty sure most of the Somali people that end up here, they spent years, two, three, four, ten years in a Kenyan refugee camp typically oh, yeah. it's because, not a, a delta airlines no. flight out of mogadishu to st cloud it doesn't work that way no it doesn't it these people have been waiting a long time for some opportunity and not all of them are ending up in minnesota or the united states but a lot of them do i think based on the connections that have already been established with family in the different groups that are helping the people come here somalia is not a place unfortunately that you have a much chance of success if you're born there. Exactly. And maybe at some point in history that'll change. And I, I do know, or I believe I know, that there's, there's people that have been from Somalia, that have been educated in this state, in this country, but I think in this state specifically, that are back there like trying to make things yeah. better. And that's what it's going to take, is probably people 
from there that want to make it a better place and go back. I know a lot of times people say, go back where you came from or whatever. Not everyone can go back. But a few people that get really well educated here and get the support they need here might actually be able to go back and influence change in the long run in that place and other places that that just is not a place you can really have a successful life in any meaningful way from, from everything that I've been able to learn. And I'll tell you, I've, I've lived here, I moved here in the fall of 2011, so almost 10 years. I have not had, just me personally, I can't speak for the rest of the town, I have not had one negative encounter with somebody from Africa since I moved here. Positive encounters, if they're at working somewhere, if I see them uh, at a game, if I see them in the streets, I've never once had a single negative encounter with a single person who has immigrated here from another country. That's how I form my opinion, mm -hmm. is my interactions with them, not some stereotypes about them. I think frequently what happens, and I've, I've witnessed it, I've heard it, someone somewhere has some sort of negative encounter, and then they tell everybody, and then everyone that's willing to listen to them will use that second, third, fifth hand, 20th hand information, which who knows how correct it even is at that point, to then move forward assessing these people, not even giving them a chance. And, you know, that's not the way to, like, learn and live in this world, I don't think. But, you know, I'm just one person trying to do my best, and maybe someone else is doing their best that they can in that moment. I just, I wish to encourage if this conversation lands on anyone that would fall on a different side of the conversation than we tend to be, I just hope it, it leads someone in a way to think about it just a little bit differently and give somebody a chance. I'm going to, I'll be, I'll be doing podcasts either from there or later. I'll be in Greece, for instance, oh, cool. in two and a half weeks, three weeks. That I've traveled internationally. That'll be one of the places that'll be like probably the biggest cultural adjustment for me. And I'll, I'll learn a lot about myself. <laughs> and I, I've, I'm such a procrastinator. I opened the Duolingo app a few weeks ago to just try to just begin to learn a little bit of Greek so Opa. I can be, I, I don't know what that means. Is that Greek? Probably. I, I don't, think so. Probably. I, that's how, I don't, I'm going there in less than three weeks and I don't know how to do anything. It's a long flight. You'll learn. Oh, I, I better. But doing that and I just realized this language, it's a, uh, wait, this is like a different alphabet. I know they had a different alphabet. I hadn't really thought about it. This is really going to be difficult for me to do any sort of communicating with someone that doesn't fortunately speak some English. And in fact, I'm probably not going to be able to, unfortunately, at this point. I'll, I'll try to get a little bit. Google Translate. Uh, and That's your only hope. I, I will have to <laughs> make sure I've invested in the best international plan and, and do that. But I, I've done this enough to know oh, it's not easy. Yeah. Not I, easy to go somewhere and not know the language. In high school, I took Japanese. And so you had to learn the characters, the sound the characters made, and then the words out of those sounds. So it was multi-layered as far as that is concerned. You know, Somali, I believe, they use the same letters as English. So at least that's a little bit easier, but it's overwhelming. And like you said, I mean, we've heard stories, you're a sports guy, about minor leaguers who come from the Dominican Republic and they just walk up to the to the restaurant. I heard they would go to the food court, and they would just say, "I'll have what he's having," because they didn't know how to read the menu yeah. and say what they wanted. Now take that and, and apply it to every other aspect of your culture, not just the language. The food is different. Driving is different. The weather is different. The people are different. The jobs are different. Every single thing you can imagine is different, and they're doing it to have a better life. Doesn't everyone want a better life? Yeah. Yeah, I, everyone everyone wants a better life for themselves, but I, I think it's harder to really, want it for someone else. They really struggle when when you identify someone else as the other, either in your group or outside. Once they're outside of your group, there's this that's the last of your concern. I think that's kind of a human thing. You worry about what's yours first, and so a human being that's from some other group might as well be of a different species or from an alien planet because. It, we don't naturally, I don't think, care about those people the way that we do about you know, someone much closer to us or someone that looks alike. Well, and I think that's, if you want to talk about the secret of life, I think that's the secret of life is empowering other people, making other people feel better about themselves and making other people feel welcome and loved. Whereas we're so concerned with how many points do I have in my bank account and you know, what kind of car do I drive? How big is my house? What does my social media look like? And everyone's guilty of it. I'm guilty of mm -hmm. it. You're guilty of it.
But that's not, I mean, when you die, no one's going to care about how much money you made or what kind of car you had. It's the impact that you had on other people's lives that's going to be your legacy. You, Dave, it's not, not a straight line like I mentioned. You worked in Alexandria some years after I did. But I had an opportunity before I left St. Cloud that could have had me, and I used to work for, you know, this, I, this is a previous the radio group that owned the building that we're in, but I, I broadcast games on a couple of the stations that you work on now, and I had an opportunity that might have kept me, if I would have agreed to it, it would have kept me out of been working in news here. Oh. But I hadn't quit my pursuit, my dream of broadcasting sports at a higher level, and with the agreement that I would have had to make, I, I probably would have had to give that up, and I wasn't ready to give that up. And it, I ended up working in sports differently in the Northwoods League's front office and getting out of broadcasting actually kind of quickly, uh, as it turned out. But as I think to my life, how it could have transpired if somehow I would have come to a different decision at that time, it might be more similar to what you're doing now. You have a growing family, I've noticed. You have a, what, a two-year-old son? Yeah, yeah. And... A wife, and you're 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 working here doing sports and some news or some of the the, the music. It looks yeah, like. we have a my wife and I have a morning show on Mix ninety four nine every morning, and then I do a sports show in the afternoon. So this this could have been a uh, what you're doing. Yeah, you I, could I, be me. Well, and I could be you going to Greece. That sounds fun. Come with if you want. <laughs> buy the flight. Uh, I guess what I'm getting at is. Like, I, I don't do it too often, but I, I sometimes think of a few different paths that I didn't take where my life might have been. The so, Sliding Doors, is that the movie? Oh, I haven't seen that movie. Oh, but yeah, I, where it's the different scenarios. Oh, I'll have to check that out. I, I, want, I want to know more about your life then, if you're willing to sure. tell me. What, what, where might have been a different path for me if I was doing something and probably, probably would have been pretty similar to what you're doing if I would have you know, met a gal and, and had at least one child by now? Sure, yeah, I mean... I guess I'm not sure exactly what you're asking as far as how did I get here? Just tell me tell me about your life and if you, you know, is it going, like, these are the things you wanted for yourself? Yeah, you wanted yeah, this is great. Wife and family and, yeah. and to have a steady radio job? Yeah, this is great. I can't, I couldn't ask for anything more right now out of my life. I'm very, very blessed with where I'm at in my life now. I'd love to live in Los Angeles where it's warm 365 <laughs> days a year. But outside of that, it's great. Um, you know, I I get to work with my wife. We do a morning show together. My kid's hilarious, and, and he's such a good boy that uh, it's pretty great doing what I do. I'm very lucky to work for the company I work for. I know iHeartRadio just laid off a ton of people, thousands of people, and our company has been pretty good as long as you don't majorly mess up that, that you'll be able to stick around. So I feel comfortable here. And I'm well taken care of here. So, yeah, I think things are going pretty good for me. I'm very, very lucky. And you met your wife while you're both here, or did you both end she, up working here later? So I was at St. Cloud State from 2009 to 2013, and I was married at the time. And I think if she wasn't engaged to somebody, she was about to be engaged to somebody. I was the sports director at St. Cloud State, KVSC, and she was the program director. And we never really talked to each other. We've got a big age difference. Okay. And so we never really talked to each other. We were friendly with each other, but we didn't, you know, spend time together or anything. The, the sports department is kind of on an island there. At least it was at that time because we're all, like, sports people. This is campus yes. radio station. It's a really well-operated station, at least yeah, was, and I'm it sure is. it is now. It's a bunch of hipsters and then the three sports yes, guys, yes. generally. and that's who I was until I did a little news back in the day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was kind of the situation. And then in 2012, I split up with my ex, and then we, um, I ended up getting a job in Princeton as the sports director for a very, very small station there, WQPM. About 30-minute drive from here? 40? Uh, 45 okay. or so, yeah, depending on the weather. And uh, the roads get icy, and, of course, they're the last ones to get cleaned <laughs> up. So I was making the drive from St. Cloud to Princeton, and finally, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to take the plunge. I'm going to move to Princeton. I got a roommate in Princeton. Signed the lease for my townhouse on January 1st. And then January 3rd, I got hired here in St. Cloud. So I had just signed a lease in Princeton. So I was driving from St. Cloud to Princeton. Then I was driving from <laughs> Princeton to St. Cloud every day. Oh, man. But uh, my now wife, Ashley, worked here at the time in the news department. And she ended up breaking up with her fiance. I had already broken up with my ex. 
And then a year went by or so, and we started talking a little bit and hanging out, and we started dating, and obviously we ended up getting married three and a half years ago. So a lot of things just kind of fell into place for me. I worked really hard for a long time, like I said, driving to St. Cloud every day for three years and doing my time in the Northwoods League. I was a PA announcer for the baseball teams at the MAC. I was working three jobs at a time, but it all worked out. And if I could just give some advice to anybody who maybe is going to get into broadcasting, I don't think they ever even listened to my demo tape. They looked at my resume uh-huh. and they said, holy cow, you've done this, 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 and this already, you know, and you just got done with school. We'll hire you because you have so much experience. I don't know that they ever even pressed play to hear what I sounded like because they saw what I had done. And that was a result of five years of never saying no. Anytime somebody would offer me something, I did it every time. Never failed. We opened this conversation with me saying that I might have stayed too long or longer than I, you know, if I really wanted to pursue things at a higher, a higher level, longer than I maybe should have in Alexandria for those five summers because I didn't have a mentor. It sounds like you're announcing to anyone that happens to be pursuing broadcasting that you would, you could be a mentor. hundred percent. Absolutely. I would love and that. Everyone needs someone that's done more to, to like answer some of those things just to save you time or know the right people. And that's something I lacked for a long time. And I started to have it. And I, like I, pursued broadcasting i got real close to a couple pretty good jobs i thought didn't get them and took a different job in sports and left the broadcasting behind and i don't miss it i I enjoy the podcast now that i'm doing it and the different way of approaching broadcasting than i probably ever would have if i just pushed forward in sports but i it it really one of the things that whether it was my upbringing or whether it was the way they did things at St. Cloud State or whatever else I missed, I, I didn't have the mentorship either in the broadcast or maybe just some other things in life. It, it feels like it's taken me a long time to figure some things out, and maybe that's what everyone feels, that it just takes so long the sometimes. 10,000-hour theory, right? Like Malcolm Gladwell said, yes. it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. Or maybe to realize I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just, I really would advise anyone to... Try to find someone that's willing to. Uh, people, I, a lot of people, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people, I think, like to help other people. I love it, and, and you know what? I'm I'm grateful if somebody wants my help. I would be more than happy to help. I'm no expert, but I'm certainly an ear that's willing to listen and somebody that's willing to help any way I can. Absolutely, for sure. It's the least I can do. Yeah, I. I anytime someone reaches out to me, it's not that often, but I like. Can I help in some way? That's that's what my life has become. I feel like my need. Once my needs are met. Now I want to help other people yep. pursue what they need or get their needs met. Absolutely. I don't have a clock on me right now. How are we doing for you? I'm good. Okay. We're just, as we're recording this, we're just a few days after the Kobe Bryant helicopter crash. He, his daughter, several others dying in that. And this was, this, this type of thing happens every few years to some degree and I want to gauge your as a sports fan your experience on Sunday when you heard the news for me I heard it probably as quick as almost anybody because uh, smart or not one of the many in the Apple news on my my phone one of the many things that sends a little banner notifications one of them is the Daily Mail which I don't know if it's even that reputable but they very quickly will grab something that someone else has done and write something and get it out. So that, that banner hit, Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash. So then this was, as like I think it was minutes after TMZ reported on it. It was on like 1.30 on Sunday. And I think it was even before that. So I, from about 1.15 or 1.30, whenever that banner hit, I, just, I was on my couch. Just, I was going to relax for a few minutes, and I, I had dreams of like being more productive. I think I sat there for three hours just like constantly trying to read everything. And then since then trying to read and understand why, like, obviously, big deal, sad for especially those people closest involved, why this one in particular is such a big deal and why it's consumed me and what I'm trying to get from it. And I think we all, we relate to death in certain ways. So I want to understand your, uh, what, how you learn about it and kind of how you approach these big time celebrities when they die, especially the ones that maybe you know or like more. And then what was your opinion of Kobe 
prior to Sunday and then kind of how it's evolved. Yeah, that's a fascinating part of the whole story. I, I, honestly, I, I took my kid sledding on Sunday, and so I wasn't really by my phone. I went and met my grandpa for lunch down in the Twin Cities. And when I got to the car, I was going to plug in my phone, start driving back towards Sartell. And I got a text from my wife that said Kobe Bryant died. So, of course, I went on Twitter and I saw that he had passed away. And I thought that's really sad. I didn't expect it to be as big of a deal as it is. And I've been having kind of a hard time understanding, like you kind of alluded to, why Kobe is such a big deal for everybody. For instance, last night I did play-by-play for the Apollo High School, St. Cloud Apollo basketball team. And they did a moment of silence before the game for Kobe Bryant, who had no ties to St. Cloud, no ties to Minnesota. And I think what it is, is that the kids who grew up watching Kobe Bryant play, it was after the Michael Jordan era and before the LeBron James era. So it was roughly from about 1998 to 2015. Well, if those kids were teenagers then, they are probably in their mid-20s, early 30s now. And I think that's when you really start to grapple with your mortality a little bit when you're not 21 anymore and you're not going to the bar, staying up till 4 a.m. and you're, you're realizing that you're going to have to become an adult. And I think when your hero from your youth dies, it's a wake-up call. And I think the reason that this one is resonating so much is because the biggest generation for social media users, the biggest generation for consumers of the NBA is that age now. It's people in their late 20s, early 30s who remember Kobe Bryant as being their hero and it's like a wake-up call that even Kobe Bryant can die. And I think that that it's kind of shocked people into being more aware of their mortality. Definitely the mortality thing will always get people more interested. I, I always heard for years like when these artists, famous artists, they didn't like sell paintings until they died. I don't know how true that always is. But right. It's something like I didn't Prince a few years ago, I didn't know that much about Prince and until after he died. There's a lot of people I don't really try to get to understand them as a person as best I can until after they die. For Kobe, he was the star player on the team that was like the best for many years while our team, I assume you're a Timberwolves fan, of course. was occasionally being kind of good enough to be almost relevant and then sometimes losing to the Lakers and losing to other teams. I wasn't a big Kobe fan. Like, I knew he was good. I don't know if he is quite... He was kind of a villain, right? I mean, he wasn't known as, like, a a good guy in the league. Like, he was a villain when he played. How much of that, and this was was fascinating, too, the, the fact that there was a few people trying to inch forward with the fact that in 2003 he had the sexual assault criminal case that was dropped, civil case that he paid however much money to make that go away. I, that For me, that after that, I don't, I guess I can never know how I would have looked at him. After that, I just, I knew he had done something that he might have gotten away with. And so I didn't like hate him or super dislike him after that. But I don't think I, for that reason is one of the reasons I didn't possibly really love him the way that I realized so many of the people did or at least claim to like that he was like their favorite guy in part also because I was a Timberwolves fan but just seeing and do you do you get a sense of why yeah you saw him as a villain why he was so loved and I have a couple answers to this but I'm, I'm wondering like love like above there's other players from the generation that were really good maybe it's he was in the Lakers you know, people want him to be the new logo. I don't think that, I think that's just people it, overreacting. It's overkill. No, it that's is. too much. With all due respect, I think part of it is the person that he became after he retired from the NBA. He started really reaching out. He started becoming an, an ambassador, an advocate for the game. He was a great parent by all accounts for his daughters and a good husband for Vanessa. And I think people were really buying into what Kobe was becoming and forgiving him for anything that he might have done in the past. I think he was really coming into his own as a man. He was only 41 years Mm -hmm. old. And I really think that people were excited to see what Kobe Bryant was going to become. I, as I think only happens because of this, I've been listening to a lot of perspectives on it. And something, this, this is my sense, and I wish I could know if it's true, you can tell me if you've gathered this sense at all or not. But he seemed to be someone 
that as a major celebrity was actually outwardly down to earth, like tried to interact with regular people as if he was a regular person, which in turn, if he's done this like every day for many years, anytime he's around regular people, and I get the sense that that's maybe what he was doing for a long time, especially now that he was out of his playing career, that he has in the impacted individuals yes. more so than most celebrities ever will in that time frame. Like people have good story, like really good positive stories about interacting with Kobe. So for a lot of people, like people have had that, or they've known somebody that's done that, and then seeing some of the stuff, like he seemed really generous with his time to good causes now. And maybe that's kind of the reason that he took the helicopter. He wanted to really be effective with his time and do as much as he could. So I, I get the sense that he really, whatever happened, if, if that the worst moment of his life, the worst thing he ever did was whatever happened in Colorado in 2003, and that happened one time. I, I don't know, you, you don't quantify these things because certainly there's that person and many other people with a similar experience that that really has harmed their life to be involved in any sort of sexual assault potentially in, in that way. Seeing all these p positive interactions with other people, it does demonstrate that no matter what you've done, you can still do a lot of amazing things. And I, I think that's why. P I didn't realize this so much about him. People loved him because if they met him, he was an awesome guy to them. I think that the people sometimes have a notion or a preconceived notion about somebody and they don't want to accept anything that goes against that notion. And I think it goes back to what we talked about with people from other countries immigrating to the United States or refugees to the United States, that we get these biases and we get these preconceived notions about people like Kobe Bryant, what he did in 2003, an awful thing. No matter how it went down, whatever account you read, it was a bad thing that happened. And that's all we're going to allow us to think about Kobe Bryant. We're not going to accept that he might have done good things besides that act, we're only going to think of him in those terms. And it's really sad. I think Michael Jackson is a great example of that. The day before Michael Jackson died, if you walked up and down the street at the state fair and asked people if they were Michael Jackson, pff, no, pervert, of course not. Michael Jackson's a freak. The day he died, everyone was a Michael Jackson fan. We all listened to Thriller. We <laughs> all proclaimed that we always loved Michael Jackson, the biggest star in the world. And... I really believe that as human beings, we need to get back to that place where we start forgiving and we start wanting to hear the whole story about people and not accepting every bad story that we hear. Like you said on social media, one person says something, it's shared by a hundred people, even though it's a lie. Now a hundred people believe it. I really think that the way we treat people when they die is how we should treat them when they're alive. And we don't. And I, I wish I had known how exactly. well liked he was when yep. he was alive, so I would could have pursued it more in some way that it might have been more valuable. But you know, this is a le there's always death is a lesson. Yeah, always, no matter like whether to do something to do something different, probably with your own life, knowing that time is limited. We already know time is limited, but we don't. It's just hard to to grasp. I think sometimes that yeah, it was because he was so rich, he could take a helicopter to save a little time. That happened. Well, we try to save time sometimes multitasking while we're driving or whatever, and that could happen to us. And yep. it happened, certainly it's happened to people I know and, and, and so many people that that's, that's a, always a possibility. So it was, take something from this tragedy to, to be better as a person. I think for me, too, the hardest part to, for me to grasp was the father part of it and how it happened and, and his daughter sitting next to him on that helicopter and what might have happened in the last couple of minutes as a dad, I mean, that is, that's how that really affected me. Kobe Bryant as a basketball player, that's a tragic loss. But as a father in that situation, I just can't even imagine what they went through and what that family is going through. And to me, that's the biggest tragedy. And you know what? The, another part is that we're not even talking about the other people. I can barely name the other people on that helicopter. Based on my years in baseball, I... I don't know that I would have ever come across John Altabelli, who is the, the baseball coach at Orange Coast College. But on my Facebook friends list, there are some people that knew him and a couple that seem to know him very well. He used to coach in the Northwoods League. 
and it's like, yeah, this is this is. I'm, I was much closer to his circle. Yeah, and I think he won at the ABCA College Baseball Coaches Convention a year ago. He won like National Coach of the Year or won some honor. I, I could be slightly wrong with where that award was given, but he was like recognized as the coach, like on some to some regard, was the best coach that someone wanted to recognize last year, whether it was coach or as, as he was as a person. And that's, so I think, you know, that was two individuals that were doing good things in sports, but then the families and it, and here's, you know, I, I question also too, that the, how many, how long did, did the people on that helicopter, how many seconds before the crash, did they realize this was a possibility? Who knows how, you're up in the clouds on a foggy day. Are you totally confident that the pilots got under control or what you're hearing? I don't know that. But also, what is it, these relatively, un, or these no-name type of people that were on there, in addition to the baseball coach, like, how cool is that? Like, you're, Kobe is such a generous guy, apparently, that we've got space for this many people. Oh, you live near me? I come over. We'll, we'll go to the airport. We'll get on the helicopter. Like you're taking helicopter rides yeah, with Kobe Bryant based on his invitation yeah. to you, and that's like the coolest freaking thing ever that most people would ever do. And then they're there, and then they're a part of it forever in history, but kind of forgotten already. It's yeah. it's a weird thing. It's a very odd thing, and that's the celebrity culture that we live in today, right? We put them on a pedestal, and everybody else is kind of below them. And I think he was working to kind of erode that boundary yeah. a little bit to those around him. Oh, yeah. I mean, imagine how many elite people would never, like, invite. They'd, yeah, they'd take the helicopter by themselves. Probably. And, like, these are, I don't know how regular these people are. I'm sure that's not the cheapest thing to be involved in this basketball academy. But, again, I don't know for sure. I assume that there, there takes some money to even be a part of this thing that not everyone has. And so not everyone maybe is afforded this opportunity. But I think probably seemingly just normal people with normal in that scale of California that were a part of it. And how cool it was. And now for everyone involved in that academy and all the players that were there, that day, that's just that's such yeah, I a... I don't know how they move on. That's, oh, wow, that's something else. It's awful. It's an awful thing that happened. I have a couple segments I do every episode. So let's run through those before we wrap up today, all right, let's Dave. Do it. One is my personal growth segment, as I want to promote ways that I am trying to grow as a person, I, and a lot of that comes up in my conversations throughout the podcast, but I want to hear something from you that you're doing or have done to grow as a person that, by you sharing, could help somebody else. I mean, straight up, I went to therapy because I had an anger issue growing up. I was always such an angry kid. I always had a chip on my shoulder. I didn't always treat people the way that I should have, especially when I was in high school. I was just kind of an angry kid, so I went to talk to somebody about it, and it's done wonders for me. I mean, what I told her the first day I went there is I used to get mad at people that didn't use their turn signals. I would get so upset, and I got to a point where I wanted people to not use their turn signal so I could be mad at oh. them. Like, I've found myself getting to that crossroads in my life where I wanted to be angry. And that's when I knew I had a problem. So I went and talked to somebody and, and I mean, nothing's ever perfect, but we got it mostly straightened out. So I, I definitely recommend at least trying it. If you have issues in your life, if you're depressed, if you're angry, if you just don't feel good enough, go talk to somebody. It's not as expensive as you think it is. And if you go two or three times and you don't think it's working, then you don't need to go anymore but I definitely think it's worth trying because nobody should go through life miserable. And I'm a gambling guy, so if someone told me, it'd be easy for me to take this bet, that you might need to spend a few hundred dollars over the course of a few sessions or, or somewhere in that range, and there's a chance it doesn't work, of course, or there's a chance that your life has changed dramatically for the better. I mean, if you can come up with that money and just budget for it, it seems to be totally worth that risk. Oh, and no question, and a lot of insurance will pay for it. A lot of times they'll let you pay what you can. It's not, it's not like you're gonna go there and they're gonna say it's $500 up front. They'll work with you. They want you to get better. So one thing that I really love about our society in the last few years is kind of getting rid of the stigma around mental health. And people think that you have to be past a certain point to need help, but you can go just to make your life better. I was, I was doing fine. I wasn't, you know, that upset or anything, 
but I didn't want to be so angry anymore. And I needed to figure out why I was angry. And we got to the bottom of it and it, it, it was such a big help. So I would recommend people do that. You're the second or third person to mention therapy, either within the context of this segment or my podcast. And I, I haven't gone to therapy in that same way. And I, like, I don't look at my life thinking I need it, but I'm like, I'm someone that's open to the fact that, yeah, there's, there's probably things going on in my mind that I'm not even aware of that my life can get better. So that's, yeah. I want my life to keep getting better and I want anyone who I can impact their life to get better. The other segment is the being wrong segment. It's about, really it's about I'm changing, good at changing your mind. So if you can think back to your life, one of the biggest things that you changed your mind about where you could tell the former version of yourself that you were wrong also, and I hope that someone else might hear this story from you and be able to maybe work their way towards changing their mind on the same thing that might help their life in this other different way. Man, I'm sure there's a million things, but I'm kind of drawing a blank. I guess I wish that I could go back and apply myself more when I was in school and take school a little bit more seriously and open up my options a little bit more for what I did after high school. I kind of backed myself into a corner. I had bad grades. I got in trouble a lot in high school. I didn't have a lot of advocates at the school that were going to give me letters of recommendation or anything like that. I think that I would have my regret is that I didn't believe in myself enough. I wish I would have believed in myself more than I did when I was a kid. Are you saying that you were just accepting whatever was going to happen was going to happen without great intention? So do you ended up getting bad grades and getting into trouble? Right. So a lot of things happened in my family life when I was a kid that I don't know if I felt blamed for or if I felt like I was some sort of victim because it happened to me. And so I basically just threw my hands in the air and said, I don't deserve to be better. I don't deserve to have a great education. I don't deserve to be rich. I don't deserve this or that. And so I just started acting out. I gave up on my future. I wasn't really concerned about college or getting a career. I mean, it took me until I was 24 to go to community college. And then I was 27 when I went to St. Cloud State. So it took me a long time to figure out that you can do something if you want to. Um, so I would say if I could talk to young me, I would say believe in yourself and stop blaming yourself for everything that happens in your life. Just figure out how to fix it. It sounds like also that you could tell the young version of you that your life can get a lot better than it is now yes. if you try and yes. care. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's a great way to put it, that what you're feeling in a day isn't what you're feeling in a year, in 10 years, in 20 years. Things get better over time. Your perspective changes. I mean, even if you don't have more money or you're not happier, your perspective changes. You get wiser and you learn to accept things that you can't change. This has been great, Dave. Thanks. I appreciate you having me. Thanks for being a part of it. Thanks for coming all the way to St. Cloud. Oh. Are you going to take a drive around memory lane? I, I do that every once in a while. Probably not today. I just, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I wish I cared more about, I wish I had more reasons to care more about like the university. And, and maybe, I, 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 we talked about like the podcast and Facebook and just never really knowing. I hope that someday someone from the university reaches out to me and says, hey, we like something that you're doing, or even if they don't like anything I'm doing, like, come back and see this. I don't know, like, with the Beatles, the baseball team, for a couple of years, and maybe while you were there, they had some alumni things. Yeah. And I think that was the only time I was ever really a part of some alumni thing. Like, I want to go back and be a part of this. Yeah, I had a 10-year high school graduation or whatever ceremony uh, reunion a few years ago, and I think I probably have another one coming up before too many years here. I tend to go to these things because why not? Just to kind of see what happens and see who I see and see where that leads. You want to be a leads. part of it. It was a chunk of your life. And I know they have like homecoming. They have homecoming again at St. Cloud. They didn't for yep. many years at St. Cloud State. To me, just putting homecoming on the calendar isn't enough. I guess I need someone to, I, I need someone to say they want me to be there probably, like really reach out. Like, I don't know, pick up someone from the university, pick up and call me someday and maybe do this to everyone that's ever been there instead of sending out these letters, and maybe you could afford a football program. I don't know. It's quite possible. I'd probably give more money if they really thought they cared. Agreed. 100%. I'd give some money. I, I don't give any because They've I got my look. number when they're asking for money. Yeah. They don't have my number when they want me back for an event. I don't think their approach is the right way either. I don't think so. Well, 
Maybe someone will hear this and they'll change their approach based on <laughs> us and we'll have influenced them. Yeah, I don't have any grudges. I just have questions. Well, if you have more answers to these questions later, I'd be happy to hear them because you're one of my people in town now. You got it. Thank you, Dave. <laughs>